I think the one thing that everybody should put effort into is is knowing yourself and knowing other people, right? We talk about the golden rule, right? The idea to treat others as you would want to be treated. But another one that people have not heard of nearly as much is called the platinum rule. And the platinum rule just says to treat others as they would want to be treated. But you can't do that unless you know how they want to be treated. And so become students of yourself and become students of the people on your team. That'll go a long way. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. I'm your host, Brian Burton, here with the COVID-stricken Nate Minnick. No, 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 not no, COVID. No, no. Right, he's got a little bit of a throat issue, uh, maybe an upper respiratory condition. We'll I'm just uh, I'm making an application for Barry White's uh, backup singer. Yeah, I was saying he's going to replace DMX for a couple concerts. That could uh, be too, yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, Give me a uh, uh, Rough Riders real quick. Y'all going to make me lose my mind up in here. Up in here? Up in up in here. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you. Here um, all week. Here all week. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today we're going to talk about team building. Mhm. Team, team building. Work. Yes. Yeah. Um with Ryan Mayfield, who is the founder and leadership coach at Evergreen Leadership Coaching and Team Workshops. Yeah. Uh, a really interesting niche market there, Brian. Um, and he has a lot of experience dealing with anybody from Airbnb to multiple other organizations across the country in helping to develop teamwork. And the reason that's so important is because every organization you're a part of, unless you're a one man show, you have to deal with others and you have to deal with others on a team. And so being able to improve that and being able to get better in that isn't just going to naturally occur. And that's really where his specialty lies. That's right. And and I know Nate's not feeling great right now, so I'm going to give him a pass on this one. And I'm going to announce that we're going to go to Brian for the quote. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork is the ability to work together toward a common vision, the ability to direct individual accomplishments toward organizational objectives. It is the fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results. Andrew Carnegie. Mm. All right. There's a guy who knows about putting together a few systems. But yeah, teams. buddy. Did you, did you watch uh, The Men Who Built America? No, no. But I mean, he's certainly one of You've the never seen that? patriarchs of American industry. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Carnegie Steel. You've never seen The Men Who Built America? No. It's a History Channel like documentary series. For those who haven't seen it, highly, highly recommend it. I think there's probably some scenes of Andrew Carnegie uh, bolting bolting the doors of the steel mill to make his, <laughs> yeah. make his people go yeah. from 16 hours a day to 19 hours yeah, a day. A little bit of a, a dark history with him there. Yeah, you know, there's always a little give and take, isn't there? Uh, but, but, well, thanks, Brian. It's a very uplifting podcast. Right. And uh, with that, let's move on to team building. He <laughs> now was we a, can make it better. He was a massive philanthropist, though. Uh, yeah, for sure. Later in his life, he, he gave away a lot. And not just gave, like, here's money, go help the poor, but he helped develop a lot of systems um, later in life to uh, make the world a better place for the, the poor and the needy. Um, it really is a, an interesting character. I don't think they go into that in the, the men who built America documentary series, but amazing series. And his, his part of that is really cool, but I, I highly recommend everybody go check that out. That's one of those series where every time I watch an episode, I, I went away feeling like I'm not doing enough, you know, kind of like our uh, Mike Doc Simpson episode two weeks ago. Mm, Just kind of, yeah. kind of went away feeling like, how's he done more in 55 <laughs> years than Nate and I will do in our entire lifetime well, combined? Thank you for including me on that. I appreciate it. <laughs> you can't do a whole lot of arguing. I know because you're losing <laughs> voice capacity. As the longer we go, the less I have. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, Brian, one of the things that I, <clears throat> really makes me think about teamwork is a submarine. Uh, when you have a submarine, I mean, all the sailors that are on that ship are, are absolutely bound by teamwork. And if one area of the team is not in line with the rest of the team, there are significant consequences that can occur from that. And that's why submarines have all of those protocols, all those reporting structures, all those like operating procedures that are, you know, completely must be followed by the book and, and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed because there's no time to like mess up in the midst of battle or in the midst of a significant situation. And it's not like you're on top of the water on, on land or anything like that. I mean, one wrong move and you're already underwater, literally. Uh, so it's a, an interesting illustration of how teams in a confined space literally have to get along. Hopefully you're not one of those teams that feels like you're in a confined space, but regardless, it is something that we want to focus on in the how to get our teams better and what way to kick off the new year than by improving your team. What better way to kick off the new year than by watching your team play Georgia in the Orange Bowl? <sighs> That's right. Not only Michigan Wolverines' first playoff appearance, first team in the playoff era to start unranked and end up in the playoffs. Amazing. Um, I don't see how teamwork comes into play with that particular really? piece there. <laughs> Is it just one guy doing all that? It seems, it seems like that, yeah. Is it Jim Harbaugh? Is it him? <laughs> How are your Nittany Lions doing this year, bro? Um, you know, they played hard. <laughs> they did. I remember that game where they played hard, but it was a whiteout, as I recall. Uh -huh. Michigan uh -huh. went into Happy yep. Valley and handled business. Yep, that's kind of how my face feels right now. Hopefully white, we do the out. same thing in Miami and uh, uh, tomorrow night, or as, <clears throat> as this podcast airs this past Friday night. Yes. Yeah. Mm, it's too bad we can't uh, take a live look in on the results. Yeah, I might have you go back and cut this whole part <laughs> out if if, uh, if uh, Georgia stomps Michigan. In the end. It, it's actually an, illu an interesting illustration there, Ryan, with the football teams, obviously with the play calls and the schemes and the blocking. That is why I brought it up. It's like <clears throat> and like play calls and, and playbooks in particular, like routes. It's like the ball's going to a certain place. If the wide receiver runs the route, wrong and didn't memorize it correctly and just makes a left turn slightly before he was supposed to, that ball could very well end up five yards behind him or ahead of him or intercepted. It's uh, very important that every team member does the work, learns the plays, practices, role plays, if you will, and does everything the way they're supposed to by the book. Yeah, and as, uh, as a Philadelphia Eagles fan this year, let me tell you, it's not only just about the person who has the ball. It's also about the other people, too, because Philadelphia has been called like probably seven times for an illegal pick block um, that has literally taken points off the board because somebody started blocking before they were supposed to. Ugh. And there you go. So if you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the refs have called it so many times this year. It's the stupidest thing. <clears throat> the guy doesn't have the ball. His main job is to pretend like he's running a route and then accidentally run into the defender. Uh, but it's so obvious when they literally start grappling the guy down the field that they weren't planning on running a, a route. And so yeah. they get called. It's too bad for our other two Philadelphia Eagles fans. <laughs> who listen to this show. <laughs> that would be Nate's son and Nate's wife. The point is that if you're, even if you're not the so-called leader, the guy with the ball, your point on the, t your, your placement on the team, your impact on the team is equally felt. And that, that goes both ways, both in penalties and in progress. And that's a, that's a really good point to remember that this podcast is not just for so-called leaders. It's for leaders and those who are aspiring to be leaders and those who have the potential to be leaders and those who have dreamed of becoming leaders. So unless you're any one of those uh, or you don't count any one of those, um, I think you're lying to yourself because there is a, a concept of leadership within all of us. And that's something that I hope we'll hear from our guests today develop out a little bit further. With that, uh, no further ado, let us bring in our guest and put him in your passenger seat, Ryan Mayfield. Our guest today is Ryan Mayfield. He is a teamwork consultant and certified Enneagram coach. Even though he'd sat through almost every imaginable version of a leadership training and personality assessment, he never really felt like those trainings left a truly lasting impact on himself. 
or those he worked with. That all changed when he encountered the Enneagram. This led him to start his own company called Evergreen. Today, he works with many business leaders, teams, and others across a wide variety of industries, using the Enneagram to help them understand themselves, each other, and communicate better and love their jobs. He is obsessed with things like good coffee, travel, cricket, that's the sport, not the phone or the bug, and helping teams and leaders thrive in every season. So with that, let me pop in a lozenger and welcome Ryan Mayfield to our show. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Great to have you on, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, we understand that you are a bit of an expert when it comes to this. In fact, this is what you do. You are into team building, consulting around team building, uh, and you're actually a certified Enneagram coach as well. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so Mm -hmm. uh, you've worked with clients such as Airbnb and many others, and that's very exciting as well. So I think you come with a, uh, certainly a level of expertise as well as influence, not only, um, in, in team building, but across the nation with working with these other companies. And so we're privileged to have you on the show today to talk to our audience about team building. Yeah, well, thanks very much. It's something I am excited about and I think something that people probably don't focus on quite enough. What is, and it's just a uh, plumber posing as a manager and podcast host here, um, what is an Enneagram? <laughs> Nate said that and just mowed over it like we all know exactly <laughs> what, what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, for those that, that don't know, um, Enneagram is, uh, it can be used a lot of different ways, but the way that I use it is uh, sort of as a personality assessment, if you're familiar with um, any other really popular ones like DISC or yeah. Myers-Briggs or Strengths Finders, um, it can be used in a similar way to that. It's slightly different in, in some of its applications, but um, that's the one that I use most often to help teams understand themselves and the people that they work with and how they communicate and work together better. Yeah. Yeah, we've used uh, DISC here uh, quite a bit, and then we're also familiar with uh, Cobalt as well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Okay, so uh, we want to we wanna learn a little bit about you um, and what exactly got you into this. I, I can't imagine, you know, at uh, five years of age, mom and dad were asking you about what do you want to do when you grow <laughs> up, and you're like, I would like to be a team-building consultant. Right, so right, how yeah. Did, how did you get there, and what was that journey like? <laughs> Well, um, for me, you know, I, I kind of call it a non-traditional path because you're right. It's not something that, you know, most kids grow up dreaming of doing. Uh, for me, it was more I was on the receiving end of a lot of different coaching and training and workshops and, and things similar to what I do now, uh, just in different teams that I was a part of. And so got to see the benefit of that. And then uh, for me personally, just one of my kind of giftings or strengths, I guess you could say, is that I'm a good teacher. Uh, I'm good at taking big concepts, studying it, and being able to turn it into something that's useful for other people. And so um, I started getting asked to come and to speak on this or that subject uh, related to, to teamwork and team building. And so from there, it was just kind of a natural progression of, I think I should make this a side business to building it up to where it was a full-time gig for me. And I've been doing that for several years now. Wow. That's very cool. Um, with, when it comes to the, the reason, um, we'll call it the why, right? The why you Mm -hmm. got into this. So you said that you had a lot of experience, uh, benefiting from the teams. Did you also have some negative team influences that would have, uh, drawn you into this field to try to make it better? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've had, plenty of those as well. And so seeing the need for it, um, not just the benefit of it, but the the real need for it, even on teams that you wouldn't think, you know, it was so needed you from the outside looking in, you would think, man, this team's great. The leaders got it together. Um, but being on the inside, when you see kind of the inner workings, uh, you know that it's needed. That is certainly something that I can resonate with as, you know, you kind of get, you can get lulled into a sense of security that, oh, everything's working fine. The team's good. And then, you know, something hits the fan and all of a sudden (laughs) the weaknesses Mm -hmm. start getting revealed really quickly and you become very much and uncomfortably aware of the fact that the team is not good. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So let's jump in. Um, Let's, let's start off with a simple definition. What exactly does a team building consultant define team building to be? 
Uh, yeah, so I talk a lot about teamwork, team building a little bit as in like putting a team together, but um, teamwork is what really keeps, you know, the team that you've built around, right? right. And yeah. so for me, I want to work with teams to help them to understand each other, uh, understand the way that they communicate with each other and, and help make that better. Uh, and then just to help them work together better based on their personalities, based on what they know about themselves. So self-awareness is a big piece of it. Uh, and then what they know about each other as a unit. So do you have a side gig in marriage counseling too? <laughs> you know, uh, I have done plenty of that actually. That is a, not an advertised service, but my wife and I <laughs> do love to do uh, especially premarital counseling. But yeah, we've done some of that as well. Nice. Yeah. Uh, team of two is certainly... Uh, just as difficult as a team of six sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes more so because yeah. you're with that one all the time. <laughs> That's right. And there's no majority. So there's there's no swaying the opinion one way or the other. <laughs> right. It's and you can be very right and very wrong at the same time. <laughs> Don't I know it. Yes. Yes. Brian's well aware of that as well. Yes. Nate can be very wrong quite often. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Podcast host team of two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Ryan. So, um, why don't you, I hope you have some stories because I, I do love stories and hearing, uh, he, hearing, you know, kind of the, the successes and failures of teams. In fact, we're a big fan of Patrick Lencioni uh, around here. Oh yeah. And he has such a gift in storytelling with the problems mm -hmm. of teams and everything. We really appreciate, um, his book, uh, the five dysfunctions of a team. Um, yep. uh, I'm sure that's on your recommended reading list. Uh, but that's something yeah, absolutely. that we've, we've looked at a lot and, you know, the foundation starting with trust and moving up the pyramid from there. Uh, but we kind of mm -hmm. want to give, get your perspective on things too. So uh, let's start off with um, the most negative side of this. So let's say that I'm a listener and I think that I am currently in a dysfunctional team. Where do mm -hmm. I start? Is, is it an awareness piece? Uh, you know, what, what do we do? Well, I think it always starts with self-awareness, right? So uh, this is something that applies whether you are the leader of the team or if you're the newest person, you know, at the bottom of the totem pole, um, is that self-awareness is always where it starts. Um, because whether or not you realize you are part of the problem, you probably are, right? <laughs> and so um, I think just knowing as much about yourself um the way that you communicate, what tends to trigger you, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, if you can get a handle on that, you're going to already, you know, solve a lot of the problems before they even start. So does it, how much of an impact does it make if you are, uh, like you said, bottom of the totem pole or the new guy, the new guy in the team versus, you know, the been here 30 year veteran, like what, what mm -hmm. difference of an impact do you have and, and what role difference do you have? Uh, I think that, that uh, there's a lot there, right? So I, I coach teams and specifically team leaders a lot to really listen to and give a voice to the newest people on the team uh, because the newest people have what I call fresh eyes. Um, you know, the person that's been around for 30 years, they're doing it the way that they've always done it. And sometimes it's hard for that person to see where the system might be breaking down. Whereas the people that are brand new to the team often see things that other people that have been around for a long time don't see. So I think there's a, a big uh, impetus on teams and on team leaders and on the newest members of teams to be able to say those kinds of things to, to make the team progress and get better all the time. So I think that's really important. And then for people that are more veteran, whether they're the leader or not, I think they have to work to be open to listening to that newest person. Of course, the newest person has to be uh, humble and make sure that they're not overstepping i think it's a balancing act for sure but everybody has a big part to play there's a there's a big line to toe there between being um i like the idea of giving the, the new person a, a, a bigger voice but it's tough being a new person um and towing that line of speaking my opinion without coming across as the person who's coming in like this is mm -hmm. how we did it where i came from and it's better than how you do it and like, right. I always have a tendency in the, at least in the very beginning to try to keep my head down as much as possible. And then, you know, you want to prove <laughs> your worth and then prove that your opinion should matter versus sure. you know, yeah. speaking up when speaking up, certainly um, depending on the culture of the organization could have a 
pretty dramatic negative effect on your career, especially yeah, and, when you're new. Yeah. And there's certainly a level, yeah. like if to put it in perspective of a bank account, like when you come into an organization, your bank account is at zero. And if you start making withdrawals immediately, you're going to go upside down real quick. And so I, mm-hmm. like it, it, as a new person into a team, you kind of feel like you have to start making some deposits initially before you start making withdrawals and like coming up with ideas or game changing things and that. So where do you come out on that? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and I would also just put a caveat on there though, that you were added to a team for a reason, right? Like they saw something in you enough to add you to a team. And so you have some amount of value. It's not like your bank account is completely empty. Okay. Uh, I agree. I like you got to, you know, put deposits in, but I'll, I'll say one of the most helpful uh, little phrases that I tell people to use a lot of times. And this works if you're the newest person on a team or if you're the leader trying to give some difficult feedback to somebody. Uh, people will actually give you permission to say things that are difficult. And the way you do it is you ask the question. So imagine I'm the newest person on your team and you're my supervisor. And I say to you, Hey, if I saw something that I think might make a big impact on the team performance, would you want me to say it? Hmm. I mean, what are you going to say every time? Right. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to be like, yeah, please tell me what it is. And so that's kind of a magic phrase almost that it's someone giving you permission then to speak something rather than you just coming out and saying, well, what you guys are doing is, is messed up. I could do it better. It's, it's in, in learning the presentation of that piece, right? Yeah, I think tact, you know, is really important. That's that's part of being humble and not uh, being arrogant, but being careful in how you approach and communicate with people. All right. So what if what if I am the old dog on the team? What if I've been here for a while and, you know, maybe I'm not aware of it or, or maybe I just particularly don't care, but maybe I am stuck in my ways. Uh, how do you coach people to kind of open up their ideas to something new or to be OK with maybe changing it from the way it's always been? I think that has to be modeled from the leader, right? If if the leader is willing to be vulnerable, to try new things and to set that pace for the rest of the team, then I think the people that, you know, as you say, the old dog, uh, they're going to see that and they're either going to get on board with that or they're going to realize that maybe this culture isn't what it used to and they have to decide if they want to continue to be a part of it or not. Uh, but I think that organizations and teams that are not open to change, uh, they're eventually going to, you know, to, to run out of steam. They're not going to be able to perform to the level that they want to be able to. Now, teams are something that are constantly dynamic, right? Uh, not mm-hmm. only are you changing up the members of the team, but you're also changing the current time that the team exists in, right? So the team that existed five yeah. years ago that was functioning in a certain capacity or, or handling a certain responsibility that responsibility may have changed or the circumstances may have changed or just you know mm-hmm. how we go to business or how we go to uh, the task of what we're trying to do. That all may have changed. So as you work with the dynamics of how teams change, like what is what is the important things to keep in mind because time is constantly shifting? Yeah, I think you're, you're right on it. That's like stuff that I tell people all the time is, you know, time doesn't stop things keep changing, keep evolving. Gosh, I mean, the last couple of years, if they have taught us anything, have probably taught us that we have to be adaptable to to new and ever-evolving situations and rules and circumstances. Right. And so you have to accept that, first of all. Uh, again, that kind of goes back to what I was just saying before. Any team that's not open to changing um, are kind of shooting themselves in the foot, right? And so, yeah, you have to do that. You have to always be evaluating. I think it's important to set regular rhythms of evaluation and making sure that we're still doing what we need to be doing, that we don't need to change it, or maybe we do need to change it. I think having those built in so that they are, um, instead of reacting, you know, instead of being reactive, you're being proactive, making sure you're setting aside time to evaluate and make adjustments as needed. And by that, do you mean like 30, 60, 90 day reviews, that kind of thing? I think that's good. I think teams also probably need to have some sort of an annual rhythm, right? Uh, maybe once a year, a, a time that's set aside, and maybe not everybody on the team, but certainly leadership at least, to reevaluate 
goals for the team, roles on the team, right? People's job descriptions and our methodologies and strategies and, and all of those things to say, is this still where we want to go? Do we need to make some adjustments? I, I think uh, an annual thing like that, quarterly offsites, you know, depending on if that's something applicable for the team, I think are really, really healthy uh, for a lot of teams that I work with as well. All right. So let's get real practical about this. Um, let's take a, a particular trade, uh, HVAC techs. All right. So HVAC techs, uh, they are in a truck all day, pretty much working by themselves. Um, generally mm-hmm. any team that they, any teamwork that they physically see is going to be in the mornings. Maybe there's a meeting, uh, maybe there's, mm-hmm. you know, some gathering in the warehouse or at a, a local, a vendor or something like that. Uh, but then the rest of the day, it's, it's, mano a mano in the truck with the client and working like that. And your only teamwork from that point forward is going to be over the phone where you might have to call somebody Mm -hmm. uh, for help, or you might uh, be working with customer service on something, or you might have to have a part run out to you or check on where you can find a part, your dispatcher, those types of things, but it all becomes very phone based and you're no longer having face to face interactions. So I don't know Mm -hmm. if you've worked with uh, teams that have that type of scenario before, but perhaps you can give us some insight or stories onto the successes and failures of that type of setup. Yeah, there's one team in particular that I'm thinking about that I've worked with for a while. They're a a home restoration company, water, fire, mold, remediation. Yeah. And uh, it's the exact same thing that you're describing there, right? Like their techs have a laundry list of things that they have to be out in the field doing. And their meetings are in the morning. And one thing I know about techs and people in similar industries is that they do not want another meeting, right? <laughs> um, and, and the longer the meetings are, the worse it usually is. And so one thing that I remember helping that team do is set up some kind of very fast standing meetings. Because what often happens is they don't actually talk enough about what they are working on. And mm. so whoever the the job um, coordinator is or supervisor, the scheduler doesn't have a, a good enough grasp on where everybody's at and what they're working on. And so people work on the wrong things at the wrong time. Uh, the urgent things maybe don't get addressed soon enough. Uh, things get, you know, dropped, fall between the cracks. And so one thing we did was set up just a real quick, I mean, five minutes, uh, you know, 10 at the most standing meeting of everybody on the team gets like 20 seconds to say, here's what I'm working on today. Boom, boom, boom. It makes sure that everybody's accountable to something, but it also gives the coordinator or supervisor the chance to say, actually, no, I don't want you to work on that right now. I need you to be on this job instead. And just aligns everybody at the beginning of the day so that no one wastes their time throughout the day and then gets frustrated later because this person didn't do this and this didn't get done. Uh, And so it's a really small thing, but it makes a big impact on a team like that. Yeah, we've done uh, what we call them hallway huddles here at our organization, and uh, it gets everybody out of their chairs or, you know, uh, you can have a meeting standing. In fact, uh, in many ways that can be more effective because there's all kinds of studies Uh about how it it breaks the pattern. It breaks your normal train of thought. So you naturally Uh turn into more attentiveness uh, in that terms. But uh, yeah, quick, quick and easy, like, hey, group, you know, real quick rally up here about this, about that, et cetera, et cetera. And then break and go back on. So I, I think there is a lot of room for effectiveness in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, what are some things that can go wrong in a team as, as we kind of step back a little bit about this, you know, teams are always going to be a part of organizations and we all know that there's good ones and bad ones, but what are some key evidences of teams that are going to be having challenges? Uh, I think some of the main ones. So, I think about different types of leadership and, and this doesn't just apply to a team leader. This actually applies to anybody on a team, but it's easiest to see in the leader. Right. And so there's a few different types of, of leaders. And when I see some of these different things come out, it's a big red flag. So uh, the first one would be what I would call the dominating leader. And, and that's the kind of leader who's really ambitious, who wants to get a lot of stuff done, who pushes their people, which is not a bad thing. Uh, none of these are, are bad things. Um, but what they don't offer is a whole lot of support, you know, on how to actually get stuff done, to, to give people what they need to be able to achieve it, right? So it's, here's your goal, get out there and do it. 
and that's kind of it. Uh, and that, what that does really leads to a lot of people burning out and being frustrated and even creates kind of a culture of fear and manipulation on a team. The opposite of that, though, is also just as bad. That's a leader who uh, gives lots of support. Hey, what do you need? How are you guys doing today? Is there anything I can help you with? But they don't really push the team, right? So there's not a lot of challenge. Right. And that, like I said, is just as bad. It creates this culture of entitlement where people feel like they deserve, you know, all the accolades, but don't have to put in the work or where they don't trust that when someone says they're going to do something, that it's actually going to get done. And then the other one, which I think is probably the worst out of all of them, is when a leader does neither. They don't give support and they don't give challenge. They just kind of are there and uh, they punch the clock. Right. They might say, my door's always open, but very few people will actually, you know, utilize that. Uh, That's very different than a leader who offers both support and challenge and really liberates frees their people up to do incredible work and um and so those are some different things that i definitely see those are broad strokes for sure but it's not terribly difficult to see that and we've probably all been in an environment where we felt like the leader did one of those things right and uh, and none of those are what you want no when you said the the over overly dominating leader causes uh fear and manipulation in the ranks what mm-hmm. what did, um can you give us an example of that Yeah. So I remember a story of a team one time who, uh, you know how some companies will have uh, like a wall of fame or something. They'll put up their employee of the month or or whatever. Yeah. Well, Brian's been that 12 months running. Oh, I'm that overly dominating guy then because I just put my own picture up (laughs) month after month. Well, congratulations, man. That's that's quite an achievement. You know what I mean? 12 months running. (laughs) (laughs) Undefeated. Um, well, this company that I, uh, I'm thinking about, they actually had in their break room a wall of shame where when someone messed up, the team leader would put them up on the board for serious? everyone to see. Wow. Yeah. Is, is, that, part of a, is uh, that part of strong team building or was that a different lesson? It is, it is not. <laughs> no, it is not at all. But that's what I mean by fear and manipulation, right? Like you can't mess up. You can't admit faults or admit that you don't know what to do because as soon as you do, you know that you're going to get blasted for it or you might even get fired. And uh, when you can't admit mistakes or admit that you don't know something, that's just setting up a system for failure because people are going to push through and make lots of mistakes that are actually going to cause more damage in the long run than if they just owned up to it at the beginning. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. But here's my challenge. So obviously that the, the impetus of who sets the tone of that reality, meaning like who is the one who says, hey, it's okay, we're here to learn, we're all together, you're going to make some mistakes, that's all right. That's the leader. What if I'm not the leader, but I still exist in a team that feels extremely dominating and I feel like if I, I'm walking on eggshells? Yeah. I think that even if you're not the leader in name, everybody has some amount of leadership on a team uh, because another word that you could use for leadership is just influence, right? Right. right. So even if you're the newest person on a team, you still have influence there. And so it takes a a bit of bravery and courage, but to model that, uh, maybe, you know, the leader isn't open to you making mistakes, but maybe someone else on your team might be. And so if you can go first and, and model that and uh, create even just a little pocket of that culture within your team. Uh, that's, that's always a net positive. I, I love that. Uh, I really appreciate your, your feedback on that. And I think it is, we talked about it in other episodes too. In fact, we, uh, we did one, um, a recording that hasn't even released yet about leadership and it's talking about owning, owning the, role before you own the title, right? Like stepping into that. And I think in many ways you're saying that's how you can be in a team. You can be an influencer without necessarily having the title. (laughs) Employee of the month for 12 months running. I'm just, I'm just saying. I know. Still marveling at that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay, Ryan. So I appreciate the fact that, um, you don't have to be a leader in name to be an influencer in the team. All right. What are some on the flip side then? What are some things that you consistently see in healthy teams? That's a, a great question. 
I think uh, healthy teams are really well aware uh, of the fact that their teams are made up of people. You know, so often in unhealthy teams, it's just like everybody's treated like a machine. But in healthy teams, people are recognized as having real needs and desires and different motivations, right? So different people on a team are motivated differently. So, uh, you know, I think of a business right now who the owner is motivated by money, which is not a bad thing, but it's not what everybody's motivated by. And so they have had to learn that just walking around handing out $50, you know, bonuses to people is not the thing that is going to retain all their best people. Um, you know, and so I think just understanding that, that a team is made up of people and people are all different is one of the most important things that, that people can do. Uh, and also just being able to trust people and empower people, give people opportunities for leadership and growth and development. All of those things are important to a healthy team culture and keeping uh, your best people. I, I think a lot of times team leaders spend a lot of time trying to do things that are going to keep the most people. And I would encourage them to spend time keeping their best people. And that's well said. Um, okay. So what are, what are some other areas of teams that you've seen existing that you say, you step back and you say, wow, that team is functioning at a high level and here's the reasons why. Uh, I think another thing I've seen, so there's a car wash company that I work with. And I remember the first time that I met with them and was just kind of getting to know their leadership team and everything. And they said something that day that really impressed me. And I, I have never forgotten. Um, they said that they want people to have lifelong careers in their company. And I was thinking, wait, you're a car wash company, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, um, And they were talking about how they wanted to be able to pay people salaries and give people benefits and have a job that people are proud to have and a logo that they're proud to wear for the rest of their lives and be able to support their families and retire from there. And, uh, and I realized in that moment that my, my vision of this company was all wrong. And so I think vision, having a, an incredible vision from your leadership team about what you're going to do, not just for your community, which is great, but also for the people inside your team. And so they do that when they craft their stuff, their, their packages, their positions, they're not trying to find, you know, the cheapest labor that they can just, you know, get the most out of. They're trying to craft a company where it can support uh, people with long-term careers. And so I just think that kind of a vision for your company, for your people, uh, is just incredible. It's one of my favorite examples I've seen in, in any of the teams that I work with. Is that because what the vision was or is that because the vision was expressed and actually like carried out? Well, it has to be both, right? I mean, you can't express something that's not there. And if it's not there and you don't express it, then, you know, who cares? And it's not real at that point. So I think it has to be both. Right. But could it be a different vision that was, that was expressed? Well, I guess that's what I'm asking. Uh, what do you mean? Like, okay, so maybe it wasn't about like, hey, we want people to have career long uh, roles in our organization. Maybe it was, I don't know, hey, we want people to make as much money as quick as they can. And that's our mission. And we expect turnover in five years. Like not, not that I expect turnover, but that it's kind of an industry standard or something in that nature. But it was, it was still, we had a clear mission that we were going for and people were about it and we were very expressive towards it. Yeah, I mean, I think that can work. I think clarity, uh, you just said they had a clear mission, and I think clarity is is hugely important. If people don't know what it is, then they can't get behind it. But if it's clear and everybody's excited about it, so I mean, if you have a company where your goal is to make millions of dollars in five years and then lose everybody and everybody's excited about that vision, <laughs> then I I guess it's, you know, so Enron, go for it. Would that be Enron's yeah, mission right. statement? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something like that, yeah. Well, I, I know like the the Dave Ramsey network, um, we had um, George Camel on here from the Entree Leadership Podcast and their, mm -hmm. their mission is probably less uh, in terms of longevity for the, the employees being there and more that they are completely out of debt and gone through they, what they call the baby steps of financial peace um, mm -hmm. and that they're, they're out of debt, no debt, investing, saving, and... Um, you know, building for the future, whether they're with them or not. So I think what Nate's trying to say is, or ask is, 
was it is it the clarity of the vision that makes it so impactful to you or was it the actual vision itself uh i think it was probably more the vision for me personally just because it was so large right like most businesses most people when they create a vision statement it's not generally that large you know Life long uh yeah. And, and just in scope and scale, it's not like they were just trying to keep their employees. They wanted to like make it awesome for their employees and, uh, and for their employees' families. Right. So the scope of it was just so much uh, bigger than what I expected and what I think you see with a lot of companies in, in an industry like that. Yeah. Especially for a car wash. Yeah. So that's, I, I love how you stated that, it, like having that big vision is is so enticing. And yet the big piece of that is the communication of it because the vision can't just be something that's put on the wall and then everybody walks by it in the hallway and eventually nobody sees it anymore. Communication right. is, is a big piece. It's a big piece of leadership and it's, all, and it's a massive piece of teamwork. So as you get in and you consult with teams and you, and you begin doing intensives and coaching and, and whatever uh, is a part of kind of your consulting, um, how does communication factor into that? And, and what are some quick like steps or, or action points that our teams listening can take immediately to begin improving communication? Yeah, I, well, I love that you brought up the putting the, the vision or the mission on the wall because so many organizations do that. And that's not a bad thing, but unfortunately for a lot of them, that's kind of where it ends. Uh, and so whenever you are in sort of a planning phase and talking about your mission or your vision uh, statement for a company, the statement is good, but what you also need to make a plan for are what you could call vehicles, right? Vehicles for the vision or for the mission statement, for the values, right? So not only what are our values, but what are real tangible ways that we're going to showcase these values? So if we say that we value longevity in our company, we can't just say that we need to have a plan for how we're going to show people that we value that. So what are we doing for employees that are here for a year or five years or 10 years? Uh, how are we actually putting that value into action? What vehicles are we using to do that so that it's not just a thing that's on the wall that people walk by? Because honestly, most of those companies that have things on the wall like that, if you ask people in the company, Hey, what's your company's mission statement? They will not be able to tell you. I have asked CEOs and business owners what their company's mission statement is only to have them say, uh, it's something about creating, uh, uh I should know it. Oh, I should know it. Right. <laughs> Happens all the time. All right. Let's, let's test this out. Brian, what is our mission statement? Um, Oh boy. <laughs> we have two. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking 12 we, months running. So we have employee of the month. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so we have an outward and an inward facing mission statement. The inward would be, and the one that would be my most important one, uh, is creating high dollar opportunities for our team. How about the other one? To be the best home services, on time home services yeah. company in our market, which is. Really. It's funny because that, I mean, that is what the customers see us as, but our, the internal one, the, uh, to provide high dollar opportunities for our team, that's the one that we talk about nonstop. Hmm. Yeah. And so then I would just ask, you know, the, the different components of each of those, what are the vehicles that actually put those values or that mission statement into practice? What are the real things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that illustrate those? Yeah. Those are good questions, and, and that's certainly something that we continue to ponder, and we look for ways to live that out um, because we don't desire at all for it to just be a slogan. It, it needs to mean something. Yeah. I, I go back to that restoration company that I was talking about earlier, and one of the coolest things that we did with them, they decided that one of their highest values was customer satisfaction. And so what they ended up doing uh, was in their warehouse, the owner bought a TV and, and set it, you know, put it on the wall in the warehouse and had it hooked up to their Google reviews. Mm. And so all Ooh, day that long, sounds, that sounds a little scary. TV just <laughs> scrolled through the company's Google reviews. And so the people were seeing it all the time. And it, what it made them do was every customer that they, you know, went to, they made sure that they knew, Hey, we'd love for you to, 
fill out, you know, this review. Here's a business card that's got a website on it. We'd love if you would go there and do that. And so they started seeing this huge uptick in positive, uh, you know, reviews from their customers because they decided that was going to be one of their highest values. And they decided that they weren't just going to put the words on the wall, but they were actually going to put the, the real reviews and testimonials of people out in front of, of them and keep it out there so that it was always on their mind. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. And I think we can take note of that. Um, we've actually started doing a little bit of that, a little bit of that here at our organization. We recently did put up some TVs in our training center and I, I actually add, uh, a branded review from all three of our divisions each Monday and that gets shown mm. up on the TV. So like, it's nice to know we're awesome. on the same track. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Ryan. So, uh, with, with what you do with your actual role and how you implement your company, like, do you go into a team and, and just start investigating things or, or do teams come to you and you just kind of go through a curriculum? What does that look like? So different teams kind of enter into it differently, but the most common way that it happens is I'll go in and do like a half day workshop with a team about communication and personality. And then from there, a lot of the teams decide, hey, this is something that we don't want to just do once. We want to actually make this an ongoing thing in our company. And so then it'll go to, uh, depending on the company, maybe once a month, a one hour, you know, lunchtime workshop kind of a thing. Okay. Or other, other companies I have, I'll meet with the teams multiple times a month, sometimes to bring new content, sometimes to coach through real time issues. And then also, uh, one on ones with leaders to help them with maybe issues that they're facing with team members or just other business matters that they, uh, could use some outside input into. And so different teams look differently depending on what they need. But a lot of times it starts with a workshop. That makes sense. All right. So let's hear some success stories. Uh, give us an example of a time that you went into a team or, or a team came to you and you were able to root out some causes that made the team function better walking away. Yeah. So I think about uh, a team that I work with. It's a, it's a national brand of, uh, of children's consignment stores. Okay. So, uh, you know, clothing and things. And there's, there was a person on the team. It was one of their directors, uh, you know, on their executive team who honestly, she had just kind of had it. She was done. And one of the things that I do with teams is I become this kind of neutral third party safe space for people to process. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to get accused of people being people's work therapists. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I regularly send out coaching emails to people on the team and they are anonymous and uh, I see what they write, but we have an agreement where I'm never going to directly share what someone said with anybody on the team, including the team leader. Uh, but what it does allow me to do is when I see a pattern of people being burnt out or frustrated about the same thing, I can go to the team leader and say, hey, you've got several people on your team that are really frustrated about this thing. What are we doing to address it? And so I started seeing that on this team and specifically with this um, one director uh, in particular, even to the point that one day I got one of those emails that took about 10 minutes just to read top to bottom because it was so long and she was so frustrated and just ready to quit. And so through talking with her and uh, through talking with the team leader and other people involved, uh, she's still there many months later. And uh, I'm pretty confident in saying that that saved that company a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of just, um, you know, frustration with having to try and replace one of their top level executives. Uh, it was a pretty big deal and I was pretty uh, happy with, with how it turned out. That's great. So what were the takeaways that you, you personally learned from that? You know, it's, it's funny because it's so similar to so many different situations like that, that I have dealt with the vast majority of the time people don't know that they're doing things that are really upsetting someone else, right? I tell people all the time, whenever they're frustrated with someone, you know, that person, they probably didn't get up this morning and think, you know what? I really want to piss off Brian today. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, Nate, Nate did that. Did. Yeah. Brian's that, put that me on the wall of shame, today. the wall of shame many months. So <laughs> yeah, I already, I already uh, sent an email to one of my uh, minions, if you will, that they need to get that wall of shame built. 
<laughs> good, good good i'm i'm glad i've had an impact in my time here with you guys today. best best takeaway uh, from this podcast <laughs> the wall of shame <laughs> well other than nate uh most people probably don't wake up with that kind of a thought in their head right and so people are just unaware of what they're doing and how it's being perceived for the most part it's not 100 percent of the time true but the vast majority of the time it is and so just being able to say hey have you talked to this person about this and yeah, almost every time people are like, well, no. <laughs> and so being able to encourage that to happen and create an environment where people are willing to do that. I actually just talked with this director yesterday. And one of the things she said to me was, I got to the point where I realized I was getting ready to quit. And so I was free to then go have the conversation with uh, my boss because the worst that was going to happen was, it wasn't going to get fixed and I was going to quit like I was already planning on doing. And so she did that and she still works there today. All right. So let's, let's shift gears then Ryan. So as, as we're continuing to explore the idea of teamwork, what type of activities can a team do? Like, are, are you a big believer in like the whole team building activities? Like, you know, Hey, let's do a trust fall or like, Hey, let's go throw knives at a wall this weekend. Like or wheel of fortune uh, day before Thanksgiving. <laughs> like we does, did here. Does that stuff mean anything? <laughs> does that mean anything to teams or is that all just kind of pop and circumstance? I think it certainly can. Uh, but what I see happen sometimes is, you can have a, a bad team culture or a leader who doesn't understand the needs of their team and they use things like that to try and smooth it over as if that is the thing that's going to solve the problem. Uh, and that that's not a good way to use those. I think when you have a good team culture, those kinds of things can make it much, much stronger and create good social bonds between people. But uh, if you've got just an egotistical leader, uh, throwing axes is probably not going to fix it. Might not be safe for said leader, I'm guessing. Uh, that also could be very true. <laughs> so you, you do encourage these kind of things, but as a, as a kind of a team solidifier, but not a team builder. Yeah, they're, like I said, they're not going to solve the foundational issues that are there. Um, and so, yeah, I think they can be great but they're not the, not by themselves. Yeah, it is. It's fun. It's fun for us to do this, this kind of thing specifically because 99% of the time we as managers are interacting with our team um, just by nature of what we do for a living. It's, it's, it in, involves work. Like it involves what we do for a living. So when we have a chance to cancel the normal morning meeting, like, Christmas Eve or Thanksgiving Eve or what have you, or, you know, around New Year's Eve and do a meeting. That's just fun for everybody to, you know, play a team game, a guessing game, win some cash. Um, it's just an opportunity to get to see and experience each other outside of what we do throughout the normal course of the work day. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I know a team, I'm thinking of one right now that I'm obviously not going to name, uh, but uh, the the team leader and business owner, she throws just an ungodly amount of cash at her team. Um, sometimes with events, you know, I mean, even things like going on cruises together. Which, right? uh, and, which company was this yeah, again, Tell us all here. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if I told you, I'm not sure it would make that much of a difference because I don't know of many teams that have a higher turnover rate than mm. this one does. Wow, that's, uh, that's telling. And it, it's, it's extremely telling, and the reason is, uh, just like what I was saying, you can throw st stuff like money or events or perks at problems, but those kinds of things don't fix the underlying problem, which is that this team leader is so incredibly ambitious that nothing that their team does is ever quite good enough. And so she continues to push and push and push, and, um, and people eventually break and leave. And so the amount of turnover I've seen in their company over the past couple of years has just been pretty astounding, even though, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in, in things like that. Okay. So it's not all about the money. What, what is it about, Ryan? Sometimes for people, it's about recognition. Uh, sometimes it's simply about doing the right thing. So for me, uh, 
I'm the type of person who integrity uh, for me is just one of the top things on my list. And so if I'm asked to do something in my job and you offer to pay me, you know, tons of extra and bonuses, but it's something that's just totally against my core conviction, it's probably not going to matter how much money you throw at me, right? Other people want things that are just exciting. They can't just do the boring routine over and over and over again. So it may be a realignment in someone's responsibilities. Uh, Just recognizing the different needs that people have, the different desires and value systems that people have, and um, accommodating that is, I think, one of the best things that any leader can do. And now that's not easy, right? It's it's a whole lot easier just to sign a bunch of bonus checks um, and takes a lot less time. So don't get me wrong. What I'm advocating is not the easy or quick way, but I do think it's the right and best way. We agree with you on that. And as an organization that has certainly had its fair share of handing out cash or, or financial gifts and things like that, I think it does have its place, but you're absolutely right. It's the easier thing to just walk around and do that without having any real culture to back it up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ryan, we're going to bring it in for a landing here, but before we do that, we wanted to learn a little bit more about how people can interface with either you in your role, or do you have any type of connection points, social media or anything that they can check you out? Yeah, so uh, the place where I'm probably most active is on LinkedIn, but uh, the other social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, are all there. Uh, the website is evergreenteams.com, and uh, that's a great place to get information on services and things like that, that that I offer. But I do love connecting with people personally, and so um, you can find all my contact information, email address, social media accounts, all there uh, on the website. It's all down in the footer. Yeah, and uh, the website spelling is e v r g r n t e a m s dot com. So, what's the story on removing the e's? <laughs> a friend of mine who is in the marketing business told me that it was better that way. Okay. And uh, <laughs> except for when you have to so, type in the web address, I know I sometimes regret it, but uh, I will say that it does cause people to stop and ask me about it, which is more than a lot of business names get. You're right so, about that. Uh, you gotta, yeah, you gotta, the, the come idea, on, man. You're in consulting. You got to come up with a better answer. Like, well, we removed three E's, and those three E's stand for people who are <laughs> egotistical, uh, you know, excessive, and whatever. And then you can tie it into the actual presentation. Man, you might have a future in that. If you right. ever get tired of what you're doing over there, you know, I might pay <laughs> you for that. Goodness. Yeah, man, you got to build the story around it. Then, then you can actually say, like, <laughs> yeah, we created this for a reason. I'm usually honest to a fault, so I don't know if I'll go that that route. Well, are that, you? Uh, that is a good piece of team building, honesty. Are you still hosting your podcast, Ryan? Uh, currently, we're on a break. We're trying to figure out what is next for the podcast. I don't think it's done forever, but um, yeah, we're just trying to figure out what the next iteration of it is going to look like. But there's a lot of great content there, interviews with tons of awesome people. Um, uh, probably one of my favorites was a uh, 35-year NASA veteran. And then I had another one with a U.S. Navy SEAL. He couldn't tell me exactly what he did. It was one of those kinds of things. I love that. Yeah. That's uh, so you have three seasons of the show out and are just kind of planning for the next season then. Yeah. Trying to see what's next. So I don't know when that will be exactly, but uh, I I think it will come back and I have no idea at this point what it'll look like. What's the name of that? Uh, that's the Invincible Teams podcast. Invincible Teams podcast. Very nice. Yeah, I would recommend it. I, I listened to a couple episodes now, um, kind of in preparation for this one, and am definitely a fan. And I would recommend it whether you're on a team, leading a team, or plan on leading a team. It's something, um, in, in at least the episodes I heard, that we can all benefit from in, in whichever role we play in a team. Um, I think being on a team – in particular, it's something we need to be conscious of our own behavior and how it affects the entire team. Absolutely agree, and I appreciate the uh, the shout out for that. Cool. Yeah, I, I never have uh, any problem bringing up a podcast that records an episode a week because we record an episode yeah. a week. And what do I want our audience to do uh, all the time in their work trucks or at their desks or wherever they're listening to the show? Is just don't use their downtime on music or news or sports radio or what have you. It's 
we we're hoping and we call it the waste no day podcast but because we hope our audience is filling that windshield time with something like a team building yeah. podcast or this podcast or you know others out there if you had a sure. 40 hour a week podcast i might be a little hesitant to recommend <laughs> it when, when are they going to listen to this one but <laughs> oh gosh yeah no that you don't have to worry about that happening anytime soon i can't imagine that's a lot of work <laughs> a lot of work for one hour a week absolutely i mean a lot of work for nate for one hour a week i don't i don't do a whole lot yeah. employee of the month <laughs> is coming my way soon <laughs> there you go all right ryan hey we appreciated having you on the show today uh we want you to wrap it up for us by maybe giving us an advice uh just one on one last thing here so for all the teams out there that are, are functioning or dysfunctioning or whatever like what is the one thing that we should all be working towards to become better in teams I think the one thing that everybody should put effort into is, is knowing yourself and knowing other people, right? Uh, the thing that I constantly, you know, get people that, that give me lots of good feedback on is we talk about the golden rule, right? The idea to treat others as you would want to be treated. But another one that people have not heard of nearly as much is called the platinum rule. And the platinum rule just says to treat others as they would want to be treated. Mm. But you can't do that unless, you know how they want to be treated. And so become students of yourself and become students of the people on your team. That'll go a long way. Excellent words of advice to wrap this up there, Ryan. Uh, Ryan Mayfield was our guest today and we are grateful to have you on. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise and make sure you check out uh, those podcasts as well as his website, his consulting business, uh, because man, is there, is there any more reason to get our teams to work better than just the fact that it will make life better and improve for everybody, including our clients. Better teams will make for better client service as well. And so we're really appreciative of your advice today, Ryan. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Great to talk to you, Ryan. Hey, that's it for our show today. I hope you enjoyed listening to Ryan Mayfield talk about team building and teamwork. Um, I got to be honest, there were some things in there that I think I, I need to take away and really explore even how I lead my teams or how we're leading teams here in our organization. Um, and it's, so it's, it's always a good thing to be improving because there's one thing that we know teams are built of people and people are always changing. And that means by nature that the team will also always be changing. And so you can't ever just sit on that one and let it go. Whether you're part of a team that feels dysfunctional or you're part of a team that feels like you're winning, you also serve a part in making sure that that team is doing good. And I think Ryan brought that out today, that you can start leading in that way, even if you don't have the title, even if the team doesn't feel like it's going well, you still do you. I mean, you're responsible for you. That's something I tell my sons all the time. Who is responsible for you? You are. And I think that's a good takeaway for us to remember as we choose to look at building our teams up and making them even better. That's something we want to encourage you to do here at the Waste No Day podcast. It is our privilege to speak into your lives every single week and challenge you to do better, whether it's as a team or an individual, because we believe better individuals will make for better teams. Better teams will make for better organizations and better organizations will always find a way to choose to wake up each morning and waste no day.